Angus Young. How you doing? Good, Becca. The offspring. How's it going, Becca? Dave Grohl. How you going, mate? Good, man. Pete, it's been a long time coming. Oh, Becca, hasn't it indeed? We go inside the dressing room, speak to the biggest names in music. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones. And crack open their esky. This is exactly how I imagined you, by the way, sitting opposite me with a vodka and orange. You're a discerning chap. This is the rider. Hey, it's Becca. Welcome back to the rider and uh, what a jam-packed week it's been. We farewelled Midnight Oil and right across the east coast of Australia it is pretty much raining or flooding depending where you are. So I hope you're being safe wherever you are. It's uh, met the cancellation of a music festival in Victoria and Bathurst is going to be rather interesting as well. Hey, on this week on the rider, it's a double-barreled show still to come. Gavin Rossdale from Bush the brand new album is out now. We'll talk to him about the recording of that at the back end of COVID and, of course, uh, how the Aussie tour went just a few months ago. Gavin Rossdale still to come, but first up, Ori Anthony, can you believe this song was you. over 12 years ago? Her big debut, according to you, and now a brand new album called Rock Candy. It's coming out later on this week. The current single is lighted up and Orianthi is uh, currently in Los Angeles. She's been over there for quite some time now, working on a few different projects over the years. And I think, uh, where are you right now? Getting a coffee, Orianthi? I'm just sitting at a, I'm sitting at Starbucks right now. Oh, at you're a not. Store, that, is, so. that is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm caffeinated up. I think I've had about five today. I should probably stop. Right. <laughs> effort. A heart attack. I know, I know. So how you been? How, how you enjoying this um, this American LA lifestyle? It's been happening for a long time, obviously, but uh, you seem very much at home over there. Yeah, I've been here, got I think going on seventeen years now. So um, I miss Australia terribly. I got to work over here, so it's like you know, show. We just got back from Ohio like a day ago. Just played a festival over there, um, and and Nashville. I was just over there playing shows. So I'm always like working. So it's hard for me to get a get a window of sort of, you know, time to come back home to Australia and then get over the jet lag and then everything. So I'm trying to figure it out though. <laughs> I should be home by hopefully Christmas. I've know? got to give you credit though. Great. You haven't lost the accent because everyone does. And sometimes some people no. lose it within, <laughs> within a year, but you have it, which I'm so proud of. <laughs> no, I haven't. I mean, you know, I, I do have a tendency to round my ass sometimes when people don't understand what I'm saying. So Yes, off and on, it's like I have to kind of put on an American accent so people understand me. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah, what's the problem I've got when, yeah. I, when I travel over as well? Because they, they they ask me, they go, "What? What did you say? What? What?" And also, they'll often I'll ask me five times, and I'll and I'll have to just yes. roll my eyes <laughs> so they actually know what I'm saying. Um, Ex- exactly, <laughs> and and obviously to get to where I want to go, if I'm in, a, in an Uber or something, and they're like, "What is that?" And I'm like, "You know, it takes forever. It takes forever." So yeah, but it's all it's all good. And yeah, I mean, look, America is home now because I've been here for so long like probably more than half my life but um Australia will always be like I want to get a house over there pretty soon the next year or so by the beach that's my that's my goal so I I can come back and forth well tell you what I was at Henley um in your neck of the woods just a few weeks ago and Henley has become so trendy I mean I think it's always been fairly trendy but it was like fully proper trendy now oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> Adelaide, I got to tell you, every time I go back over there, it, it's changed, but it still stays the same. But there's something very cool about that city. And not to say that Sydney isn't cool and Melbourne and all that, but there's something about Adelaide that's kept that small town kind of vibe, hipster almost, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's kind of got this European fashion thing going on. <laughs> I don't even know I don't how get to it. describe it. No, yeah. neither do I. <laughs> but I, I understand the you know the the yearning to be at home and Adelaide's is actually pretty good these days. So uh, look, we'd love to have you back. But look, congratulations! You got the new single out. The album's out October fourteen. Um, yes. And and the previous album, which you put out, you know, in twenty twenty. I mean, that was your a big break. Like that was, I think, like a six or a seven year gap for putting that one out. Yeah. So um, you know, did, did that spark yeah. something? So you're constantly kind of thinking of new stuff now after that one? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, prior to that, you know, I was, I, I did the whole RSO record with, with uh, my ex, Richie. Yeah, and so yeah. we spent like five years on that record essentially with Bob Ruff. And so it took a long time. People are like, what happened? I'm like, well, we did that record. And then it kind of didn't even really come out. Just got sort of thrown out there um, through BMG. And then, because um, we didn't promote it or anything, yeah. we kind of split at the end. And then there was the pandemic that happened and, Prior to the pandemic, 2018, 19, I made 
uh, oh, with Marty Fredrickson, who's a dear friend of mine in Nashville. Yeah. And um, we had a blast making that record and I sort of promoted it during the pandemic, which was very strange because um, we couldn't play any really live shows. No, that's one right. live stream. One live stream at the Whiskey and we were all so stressed and paranoid because of COVID that we didn't want to go near each other and like the masks and we couldn't breathe. And it was like, I got to tell you, without an audience, the paranoia, the stress, that was not a fun show. No, <laughs> not at all. And I know a lot of bands <laughs> have had to go into these bubbles um, to do shows and they had to get multiple um, tests before they could you know, perform together and... and um, I mean, you must have had dilemmas about releasing anything during the pandemic because, I mean, technically, one, people can actually sample more music because they're stuck at home doing nothing. So you had their attention, but you couldn't get out and do any shows. And that was the big problem. Oh, uh, it was very frustrating for me because I've been performing since I was, God, six years old, since I could actually strum a chord on the guitar. Like I was always a bit of an attention whore as yeah. a kid. <laughs> so <laughs> running around, I like, look at me, look at the song I've learned, look at the song I've written. And so I've always been that way where I like to entertain people and just play and, and you know, that was really frustrating. And then we did another live stream. We're not, sorry, it was a live uh, DVD and CD that we did um, for Frontiers that came out mm. just prior to this record, Rock Candy, like a few months ago it came out. Um, and we shot it out here in the Bourbon Room and my drummer got COVID like day of show. Oh, God. So we had to, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, night, night before the show. So I, yeah. had to get, I had to get Glenn Sobel from Alice Cooper, who's like my brother too, to learn my entire set and step in for the DVD. And that was crazy. But yeah, I, you know, and I never got COVID. I was hugging my drummer, you know, we're just like hanging out. We had a few drinks, you know, in the room and everyone else got it. I didn't. So it was really weird. So I don't know what's going on there. You are superhuman. I don't know. I touched wood. You know, I might be (laughs) next week Uh, after traveling so much and being around so many people and parties and meet and greets. I did like 120 persons at a meet and greet the other day uh, in Ohio after a festival. So who knows? Give it a few days here. <laughs> I think you never know. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a real dilemma, that one, because a lot of bands have stopped doing meet and greets and um, you know, other bands are traveling literally in a proper bubble until the last show where they can then have a decent party after the tour ends. But um, yeah, it's, it's a new world. It's, it's a bit scary at times when there's money involved, know, especially. But- well, yeah, and as you know, I was uh, signing pants, T-shirts, shaking babies' hands and, you know, hugging everybody, literally. So who knows at this point? <laughs> but it's important to me, uh, you know, when people are excited and bought your record and all that, to say hello and show your you know, gratitude for the support. You know, that's that's very important to me. Yeah, so. that's the thing. It's, it is really important to meet the fans and the fans really appreciate it. And you always hear from, um, you know, the, the hardcore fans of certain bands who um, are, are with the band because the great service they give. And, and some bands are great at it. They're, they've got incredible fan clubs. And Linkin Park were always known for that. And even Midnight Oil are the same back over here. You know, they're, they've got incredible active. Are they great? Yeah, like, like really active fan clubs, you know. But um, the album, by the way, like the, the single is incredible, Light It Up. That riff is just nuts and I, and I love it. But the track after that, track three, Fire Together, I loved as well. And uh, you, must be so, you. you must be so proud. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, we made this record in 13 days. I made it with my friend Jacob Bunton and we wrote a song a day. That was our um, goal. And I said, because I wanted to make something very present and in the moment opposed to like, aside from a couple of songs that we put on there, like Fire Together uh, and there's two others or one other. Um, but the others were all written you know, during that time period because I wanted to make, you know, you know, sometimes you saw songs from a couple of years ago, whatnot, but at the present moment, how you're feeling, it was like a kind of stream of consciousness, like let's just come in every day, come up with something and then record it. So that's what we did essentially. And then the live musicians did their thing at the end and because we sort of program the stuff in the studio here in Hollywood. Um, but Jacob Bunnan, he's, he's a great friend of mine, very talented producer, writer, guitar player, violin player, uh, piano player. So yeah, I mean, it was really, it's great to make a record with a friend because you don't um, feel sort of guarded. You can really sort of just be open and honest about what you're going through, like lyrically and, and all of that, opposed to when you first meet somebody and it's awkward when you write a song with a new songwriter or you work with a new producer because you're sort of getting to know each other, you know? And, and so I've known Jacob for about seven, eight years now. So we're buddies. 
Yeah, I can imagine, uh, you know, if, if you're in the studio with a mate, you kind of feel like you're in a probably a nice little um, you know, comfort zone where you're just throwing around ideas and, and, and there's no judgment. And, um, I mean, Jacob must be a talent because he played on pretty much every instrument apart from the, the drums, you know. So that's, that's not a bad yeah. calibre, you know. No, he's awesome. And he does movie soundtracks as well and um, just, as I said, just a solid person, friend. And, and when I asked him, I approached him, hey, let's make a record together because we've written – a lot of songs together over the years and and i never made a record with him and and we kind of did it pretty manically i mean it's like 13 14 days kind of thing and let's just do this and yeah it was it was fun it really was so i'm what, happy with the way it turned out yeah and he should it, it it's it's it just blew me away and um i was reflecting on on everything you've done and 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 the most talented people you've worked with and, and been on stage with and prince and and of course michael jackson and you know dave stewart and I mean, do you pinch yourself sometimes? I mean, especially someone like Prince, who was just a, an incredible talent and a brilliant guitarist as well. Like, I would say one of the greatest guitarists <laughs> that ever lived. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was crazy with Prince because I met him, God, 2007, I believe. He called me straight after the Super Bowl he played. <laughs> wow. And it was wild because I was watching it on TV and he was playing Purple Rain. I remember it started raining. I'm like, only Prince can make it rain. <laughs> you know, doing that, like God, bring on the rain. You know, um, and you know, he's he's he was such a um, mysterious friend for for years. Um, and yeah, he called me. I don't know how he got my number, but he said, "Hey, I'm going to fly into LA and I want to jam with you and bringing Sheila E with me." And we're booking out the record plant where I was. I was signed to Indiscope Records and Geffen, so we're recording out of the record plant a lot. So we went into the live sort of band room. He played bass, Sheila E played drums, and I played guitar for like four hours. And we sort of started writing songs and threw around ideas. And then Prince was like, I want to, I want to produce your album. And then, um, and I was like, oh my God, that's insane. And, and then the label wasn't having it for some reason. I don't know why they wow. didn't want, I know. And they told Prince that. And then the next day Prince is like, let's go to a jazz club. So we went to a jazz club. I was hanging there with like with his friends. He goes, yeah, I told your label that I want to produce a record. They said, no, you know, and he was like, you know, saying that labels are evil and all this stuff. And I was like, going, yeah, I, I was like literally off a boat from Australia, kind of thing, you know, so I didn't know what was going on. And I'm like, why the hell wouldn't they want Prince to produce my record? So I was upset about that, but like confused, but I guess, you know, they had their vision of what they wanted, where they wanted me to go. And, and Prince was making sort of kind of not like super commercial music at the time. You know what I mean? So he, they were probably going, oh, he might do something experimental with me. And they wanted to put me in the pop charts. I don't know what their thinking was, but, um, but damn, he can write a song. I mean, hell, you know, it would have yeah. been, it would have yeah. been a great, ex- that would have been amazing to even do a few songs with him. But, you know, uh, I was very grateful to have the friendship we had over the years and he would always call a check in and, and uh, probably three or four times a year he would call. And the last call I got from Prince was like two, two or three weeks before he passed. And he wanted to like play table tennis with, with me. And it was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was like, he said, I didn't have a table. So I was going to get one. He was like, I'm coming over. I'm playing. I'm going to win. I'm like, well, of course you're going to win. Cause I'm a great. <laughs> so that was our conversation. But yeah, he was uh, very sweet. I love that. And I, I remember hearing about the Dave Chappelle stories about going over playing basketball at Prince's house back in the day. And um, he, he would have been just a bizarre dude. You, you can see why he had a vault full of songs because he, 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 the work ethic he had, you know, um, that was a great example with you, you know, just going out and jamming for hours and come out with songs. I know. And somebody filmed that too. I got to, I got to track that down one day. Yes. Of us jamming. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get to that. <laughs> I hear stories about how he, you know, did House of Blues one night and just booked it out and were, I think there were five different rooms simultaneously going and he did a different show in every room and, and, and went <laughs> wow. till three or four a.m. in the morning or something. And, and I, I don't know how he got that energy. Neither do I. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. He called me like to, he said, I'm, I'm playing a show at the Roosevelt. And I thought, okay, cool. And he goes, yeah, I don't go until like 4.30 a.m. I'm like, oh my God, Lord. So I was like downing all the coffee and just trying to, <laughs> you know, keep my eyes open. And that was wild. And he just, he got up and wow. ready to go. Like he just woken up. And yeah. Ready to go. So it was pretty wild. He was uh, definitely one of a kind and uh, dearly missed for a lot of people. Now tell me about your upbringing. So, so what, um, what great guitarist did you listen to? Was it um, you know, people like Jimi Hendrix or 
was it you know Chuck yeah. Berry or who who you, you who inspired you? Oh, definitely. I mean, my dad, my dad's a guitar player, so he had uh, records playing all the time. That's why I started. I mean, um, the first I think was BB King was the first guitar player my dad put on for me, and then. I mean, obviously the Beatles and that beforehand, Roy Orbison. And I started writing songs before I actually started learning how to play lead guitar. Like I learned how to play chords first and how to write a song. And then it was B.B. King and Jimi Hendrix. And then Santana was the real reason why I wanted to pick up electric because I went, I, when I put on a Braxis record, but then I went and saw him live and I was studying classical at the time. And that was really boring. It gave me a headache. Um, <laughs> But I learned the basics of theory and all that kind of stuff. But then um, when I saw Santana, it was just like mind altering. That for me, it was just like shifted everything because the way he expressed himself through the guitar, like the way he, his tone, his choice of notes, everything was. Um, so I go to church and he brought people together and was dancing. And then when he played the ballad, everyone stopped and listened. And it was like this moment, you know, and especially with Europa, that song. So yeah, definitely Carlos. Yeah. So is that, that an album you go back to pretty regularly and, and just to spark something? Is, is it always there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's quite a few uh, Santana records. Um, Sacred Fire Live in Mexico. That's one of my favorite live shows. Um, Dance of Rainbow Serpent. Um, then there's Brothers record I love as well. Abraxas, Moonflower. There's so many. Freedom records are great. I mean, I, I have them all. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now I've got yeah, to ask you what awesome. is in your writer, by the way, because uh, that's the whole idea of the podcast is finding out what you know different musicians uh, you know have in their writer, and and then sometimes it changes over the years. You know when you decide that you know you don't need that bottle of tequila every show. So oh, what do you ask for yeah. these days? Well, I'm much healthier these days. Not to say that I was um, you know drugged out and <laughs> terrible before, because <laughs> uh, that wasn't the case whatsoever. But I you know I I don't eat as much packaged food or I was eating a lot of like meat and I don't eat that much anymore. I, I, uh, I'm more of a pescatarian so, and, and vegetarian. So I kind of keep it really healthy. Everything, everything's organic. So it's like berries, usually tea, honey, um, beers for the guys. Um, yes, I do like some tequila, not going to lie. Um, <laughs> have that in there. Why not? Um, and then, you know, it's just usually just a lot of health food. I'm, I'm pretty boring like that. I mean, yeah, nothing too crazy, no exotic animals. You know, before I used to have um, a dog, I used to put that, like I had to have a, a dog backstage. <laughs> <laughs> and they would find me a dog, like literally. This was, this is what Adam Lambert was ages ago. And I put it on there as a joke, but they actually found me a dog. Like, and one time the dog actually looked, a little unwell like it looked like I had some kind of <laughs> problem like I thought it might bite me I don't know where they found it um but yeah so that's probably the weirdest thing and I had on my rider but yeah that's pretty smart <laughs> because it, it takes uh, the nerves off I reckon if you've got a dog and everyone's playing with a puppy backstage it, it, you know everyone forgets about the the fact they're playing in front of a, a few thousand people or whatever um that's a really smart idea I might have to use that one day yeah you know I had the dog because I grew up with so many animals. I had like 20 pigeons, 20 ducks, 30 rabbits. You know, I had a mini farm growing up. So I always had animals around to yeah, tend to. Yeah. And when I came over here, I didn't, you know, I had two dogs in my, apart- in my apartment when I first moved over. But, but then on the road, yeah, you miss having an animal around. And that sort of presence de- definitely makes things um, like sweeter, the whole environment changes because everyone's yeah. focus is not so tense. It's not about the business. Like, oh, how cute is this dog? And, and you know, they're very innocent and all that. So it's just, I love, I love animals a lot. So, yeah. yeah. Before you go, um, I know that there was an opening in Alice Cooper's band. <laughs> did, you, did you get a phone call? Would, would you go back? Because you had a great relationship with Alice being in his band. Yeah. Look, I'm actually playing a show with Alice um, next month. Here in LA, we're doing a, a benefit for the Palm Springs uh, thing. It's actually my, I'm playing my own set, but I think I'm playing with Alice as well. Right. And then Queens of Stone Age is playing, Paul Rogers is playing, um, Paul McCartney's band. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a fun evening for a great cause. Um, Alice did call me. He called me prior to Anita leaving, actually, to uh, fill in for some big uh, festivals over in Europe. And I couldn't make it in time because I was playing to, festivals out here myself in LA so sorry not, sorry not in LA in America 
So he was in Copenhagen or I don't know where he was, Denmark. He's like, get on a plane, you know, I'll fly you out. And, and then I couldn't make it. And then, uh, and then, yeah, he was like, we're family. So anytime. Um, but Kane went back for this run. Um, I've been busy, I said, promoting this record and doing shows. But in the future, I mean, who knows? I'm, I'm really focused on my solo career right now because I've done a lot of collabor- collaborations and stuff like that. But I really want to get back to touring with my own band and, and uh, that's what we're setting up right now with my whole new team. And, but absolutely with Alice. I mean, if he calls me to do something, I'm there. Um, absolutely. I love him. Love yeah. the whole band, everybody. Yeah. 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 I would, would love to see that one day. But look, you have got an incredible album and um, I think you've got to be proud of that. And, and, and the fact that you're building a team around you for many more albums to come. We can't wait. Look, um, Ori Anthony, I know you got to go, but look, it was so good catching up and go back to your Starbucks and uh, we'll see you back over <laughs> here, hopefully for Christmas maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I'm, I'm definitely coming back, I think in uh, April, I'll be in Australia for sure. Like, we've got a show out there and um, I'll, I'll post everything pretty soon on my, on my website when that's revamped. But right. um, can't wait to be back. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. And thank you for your time and support and um, happy you did the record. Yeah, good on you. You too. Well, take care, Orianthi. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. See you later. Okay, <laughs> bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. There she is, Orianthi, doing an interview from a Starbucks. I love it. Check out the new album from Orianthi. Rock Candy comes out later on this week. Now, our second part of this week's The Rider with Becco. Gavin Rostar from Bush. Bush were here for Under the Southern Stars earlier on this year and at the time when I caught up with Gavin he was saying uh, he was working on some new material and it's given this. The brand new album from Bush, The Art of Survival. It is out now. The current single, More Than Machines. It's pretty bloody incredible. Gavin, how are you? I'm good. Really good. Not bad. I mean, really good actually. A little day off, relaxing in Charleston, North Carolina. How's the tour going? Because I, I, I've seen the fan uh, photos going up on the, you know, on the Facebook group, and uh, you are, it's, yeah, yeah, it's phenomenal. I mean, just a really great. Um, you know, I didn't know what to expect really because we were playing a little bit earlier. Those other two bands are going out together already, and then they asked us to to, to play with them at six twenty five, and we've got like a, it's really looks great at that time. It's really beautiful. So, and you go into the, you know. The twilight and then you know the sun goes down and then it gets dark for the last little bit so there's a whole range of things like being in melbourne um and there's a whole range of, of seasons that go on so anyway we had um it's going great it's real fun twilight's a good time to see you actually i remember um walking to soundwave 10 years ago and um you were on that slot i think it was about you know five o'clock and Summer's ready to come down, and, and, and it's good because you can kick on or you can go back and have dinner. It's been great just to be part of it, uh, uh, to be honest. It feels very like uh, it's such a nice atmosphere backstage. I've known um, Jerry for some time, but never spent that much time with him, you know. And uh, I, I, we became friends the last few years, see each other quite a bit um, here and there. And now doing this is brilliant. And I have a new appreciation for him and what his band stands for and what Ben's been up to. You know what I mean? Just like you get to watch people, see who they are, how they operate. And I mean, it's as important to me personally um, as uh, on stage. I mean, you know what I mean? How, you, how people conduct themselves is always intriguing to me. You know, so yeah. it's good to see when there's nice energy backstage and it's not really an ego driven and sort of maniacal in any way it's just it's kind of it's pretty funny it's a lot of comedians well it's nice when you do see um everyone just mingling and 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 because some festivals you see the headliner they're in a their own compound separate to the rest of the bands and they don't want to mingle or meet with anyone and uh i, I hate seeing that because I, I love seeing the band sitting down after a gig you know having a meal together and having a a debrief and a chat. I mean, yeah, to yeah. be honest, in, in fairness, the, one of the best things about doing the festivals is what, who you get to hang out with. Mm. Because the shows are fantastic. You know, wherever you play, you want every night to be the best night ever. Obviously, that's that's a given. But what's nice about the festivals, a lot of bands, is you can see um, see friends and just sort of, you know, go go out, have a drink with them at other times when you wouldn't have the opportunity, you know what I mean? Congrats on the album because we caught up before Under the Southern Stars before you came out mm. early in the year, and you were saying how you're 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 working on it. And you were like, "Oh, it's it's pretty fat. It's pretty uh, it's pretty dark at places," and it's it a, certainly yeah. was. <laughs> <laughs> 
Brilliant. So it did what it said. I did, it did what I told you it was going to do. Yeah, it's really, really good. Like it's it's impressive. It's um and and I think also I liked how it just comes out of the blocks straight away. There's no messing around. You know, track one right in there. That's great. It's fun for me because and what I love that about life, that how amazing it is that it life is so magical is to be lived in 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 fragments because that's what it is. All these moments put together. Like when we were speaking before it hadn't really taken full shape it's just sort of what i wanted and it was a it was as much theoretical as the songs you know i still had to after we'd had that conversation follow through and that's what i love about life is that when you you know you make things or you you get to a point you create a body of work um i think it's really satisfying as a sort of a as someone who makes things if that's how i consider myself it's an extension of yourself as well like i i, yeah. I could imagine when you submit the album and the track listing too to to you know your, your your team and once it's locked in it's locked in there must be some temptation there to go you know what maybe we could end the album differently or maybe we can move things around in the middle or- oh it's a double thing do you really right 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 double guess um uh you know the funny thing about this job is that it doesn't come with any particular training i mean some people opt for that and they go to school and they're smart I'm, I'm an idiot and didn't ever go to school for it i just you know figured music as i as i go along you know still find it like a, a mysterious, you know, beautiful sort of infinite concept, you know, that all the, the, you know, the potential in the world. But um, it's just, I, I, I just like having a body of work. It really feels good as a songwriter just to sort of get another load of opinions down <laughs> and committed to music. That you know, feels good. It must have been um, also kind of hard to figure out where to head to during, uh, you know, the post-COVID era because um, it is, you know, it's it's an album all about resilience and destruction and it's quite dark. You uh, you nailed the sentiment there, I think, pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Best band in the world ever to bring you down. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, so I try not to be. I think this is for me. I'm a. I, I'm a really. I think a really positive person. And uh, but I think that the way that I kind of wrestle with my demons and wrestle with things is to make music and make it uh, to reflect how I feel and what I see. And you know, I'm just really lucky to have a, a unit of people, whether it's uh, the band or with Eric, who recorded us. You know, it's just trying to keep as many, ex- as few and as excellent people around us as possible. So there's not so many opinions, but the opinions are pretty strong. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty much common consensus how the song ends up is a common consensus. You know? Do you work as a team really well? Like, or was it, was it one of those ones where you go alone for a little bit and cut yourself off and do, we, do a lot of We writing? have a specific, we have a specific system that we've used for years. It just works to start with a little framework of me getting a few things together and then exploring that. Then after after that process, I invite people, then all bets are off. I'll receive music, I'll, you know, be collaborative, whatever, you know. But I sort of start the ball rolling and then um and then then kind of open it out, you know what I mean, sing other people's music, whatever. I don't, you know, I don't have to do everything. So I don't I think it's more healthy to have it split, you know, great contributions from Chris and Corey and you know, it's, it makes it richer. It's better. You know what I mean? They're, they're really good. It'd be foolish to not let them be them on the record. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Stupid. So there, it's. I think it's really. Well, I, I love it about that. We've come, become a really economic, um, as in just no wasted, no waste. Uh, pretty fierce band they are. You know, what I mean? when I play with them, and like fierce is the best word for us. It. Like it's really. You know, Nick is so drives so hard, and the, the Chris and Corey are just sort of excellent and tight and clean, and clear. Do you know what I mean? It's really like they're very precise musicians. Were you able to so demo me, demo yeah. together, or, or were you working sort of um, remotely for a little bit during this? Because because traveling was a little bit tough. Um, you know, the back end of last year and early this year. Yeah, with this was. This was I, Luckily, it's more fresh. This was when it was all right to travel and everyone was moving. This the best of, the, I guess, the most of this year is when it began in earnest. Like probably February, I started to start to get songs together. Obviously, between you and me, I've been you know been in since December, January. You know, I me mean? like fiddling, but but you know, sort of sat down in earnest. Right, all right, so like February, 
it was it was yeah, really good process. And then uh, we used to have our system, and, and everyone gets a uh, an open mic on this track, so to speak. And we sort of we I mean I think it just it, everyone's good enough that you just you basically um, try everything. You know? There's no harm nowadays. With, I mean, you can just do anything. So might as well try anything. Uh, I'm all about that. You were a dad. I mean, have you, have you found that's changed your writing a little bit or have you kept that separate? Yeah, no, I think the only thing I've got from my kids um, is just my desire to impress them or to have them not embarrassed if they're to bring their, my 16-year-old son who his best mate on the road with us who came to Denver to see a show there. You know, flew in, we had a couple of nights, a couple of great dinners, and I had a show in the middle of it. And as his buddy, and they're like wandering around, they got the passes and the, and, and it was just really exciting show and it makes me happy that the shows are exciting they're not sucky you know what i mean if they came to see me it's sucky i would be you know but they come and see me it's sort of fun and ridiculous and sort of heroic but it's just like it's just a really big crowd uh in tune with with a band you know? yeah actually, i saw a photo uh, it must have been End of last year, your birthday and all your family together for the photo. You look, you look, it looked like you were really bloody happy. Happened now and again, I mean, it, happiness is definitely, of course, like for anyone, not a constant state. Else, you'd be a people think you're a moron. You yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes uh, that could be the way to be. But you know what I mean? It's like everyone. I mean, that's why I think that this record. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this record because it sort of feels like it. it it struck a chord in the moment of what people that like this kind of music could relate to because um, it's so honest, you know. And I've been through so much. It's like, it's intriguing to, to kind of uh, just have all, I don't know, stuff that I write about even more um, interesting to myself, you know what I mean? Sort of uh, a bit more incisive, a bit more insightful and... and uh, you know, it's going in the right direction. So it's sort of exciting to share, you know, do a sort of a good collection of stuff. And, I mean, people in bands are ridiculous, like needy and this sort of like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> seeking approval and all that sort of stuff, like psychotic. Um, it's hilarious. You know? And different members of the bands have different desires. You know, there's, there's, there's a lead guitar style, there's a lead singer style, there's all the kind of ways that, and it's all types, you know, of course, all the same type of people are bass players because they're usually sort of the coolest, you know, not quite needing to be sent to stage, but kind of holding everything down and useless without them, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it was interesting because I didn't, I deliberately didn't find out what the singles were when I heard the album for the first time. And I just wanted to kind of um, make up my own mind and figure out which ones they were. And I, and I, and I mean, track one, obviously, felt like a single. Track three, More Than Machines, was definitely a single. And then I sort of looked it up online and I was like, oh, there you go. <laughs> it's it's just just yeah. strength. But also ending the album as well, um, Gunfight and A Thousand Years. I thought A Thousand Years was just a great way to end it. It was almost like it crosses over into another album almost. Yeah, yeah. that was the kind of, that's the landing. Mm. That's the landing track. You know, we've been on a bit of a journey and uh, I do like that idea. It's really specific. Mm. Everything is is intentional you know so where that you know, the fact that, that song starts the record heavy as the ocean is you know it's um, the art of survival and then heavy as the ocean is the sort of the the, the um sort of epilogue to it you know it's the sort of sums it up like yeah you know it's all going to come at you um a lot but it's sort of that's just part of living and um it's just fun to be out on tour and really experience people. I felt it quite a bit in Australia, but I felt quite a bit of fear at the beginning of the shows because it was so early on after the kind of pandemic and it was, everyone was coming out, so to speak. And it's just gotten to the point now where people can finally truly relax, you know. And so we see 15,000 people all connected who've all been through so much stuff. It's not just any two years. It's like the worst two years of most people's lives. Yeah. yeah. And the after effects, everybody's feeling now almost as bad at the time, uh, health aside, of course. But it's like you just see it in every area of, of life. Um, and so when everyone's gathered together uh, to see music they love and, you can uplift them. It's it's a it's a 
It's a great job. Well, I can imagine some festivals um, were very nervous about uh, you know bands meeting backstage. I, I went to one festival where the, everyone was in little bubbles, um, and there were no photographers in the pit, and they yeah. had no mingling backstage. And that anxiety, I think, would actually you know convert to the mood on stage as well. But was it good being back in Australia? Yeah, by the way, we, we got good. That that was that was it was an amazing amazing tour, and uh, it just I got thrown at the beginning because we started in Sydney and it was pouring rain, and and I was like, it's, it's summer, and and then we went off. We drove three and a half hours to a, a field. I was like, but there's no fields closer to the And we played there, but the show was great. Every show was fantastic. And it really, really warmed up. I think most people knew after two or three shows that we were actually coming and we were doing it. People's confidence grew. And then it became um, very sort of a summery, dreamy, some seedside towns there and stuff. It was a, it was a, it was a great tour. And, uh, you know, I was, was really happy to play there and then now i come back for this record or something yeah yeah it, it was um yeah, it's been a very weird time weather wise it's been raining the whole year pretty much it's not normal not typical australian weather but we've just got this year of rain and floods but before you go i want to talk about tennis because <laughs> i know you love your tennis uh, roger federer retiring you've played tennis with him haven't you yes and serena and venus just came to our show in west palm beach right i was so happy no way i was sort of I saw Serena, I haven't seen her for a long time, a couple of years, and I didn't have any chance of getting hold of her. And I'd seen her uh, uh, end match and all that stuff. I was like, oh, I want to congratulate her. And then she showed up there. So it was beautiful to see them. They're incredible. Um, but yeah, as to Roger, yeah, you know, what an incredible career, incredible, one of the greatest sports of all time. Of yeah. any sport. Of any well, is it just a gentleman? Just, just, just an absolute great ambassador and and very good at what he did so oh, i would did want to ask you about that because i think we're as all tennis fans were we were all very um you know sad to eventually see him retire but mate, like i know you gotta go so it was great uh, seeing you again and uh yeah, can't wait great. for the album to be out this week uh congratulations and um okay. we will see you out here very very soon gav good to see you thanks mate all the best there we go gavin rossdale from bush Check out the new album, Art of Survival. Two incredible singles already off that record. There was Heavy as the Ocean, track one, More the Machines, track three, and the album is out now. Check out The Rider with Becco on all socials. We search for The Rider with Becco. We will catch you back next week.